do you j'ai compris yeah, yeah, just... uh, do you do you see my screen uh not yet actually uh do you see that title hmm. Le Guerre de Jacques Derrida uh, I think no. this yeah. the screen is not do you... shared yeah, just uh, uh, do you do you see my screen uh, uh not yet actually oh, sorry. there's uh, a little bit of an echo do you see the have... title uh yeah we have an effect of a of weird uh, <clears throat> loop here okay i'll i'll do it again yes please. Let's, yeah. let's see so partager l'écran and so partager yeah now you, it's now you see my screen yes fantastic yes. perfect and okay uh, so just vous êtes en train de partager that's it yeah okay Okay, we are live. We are recording. I see this. Yeah, we're recording and we're live on Facebook. Uh, sorry, we're live on YouTube. I just checked that. There's one request to have the CC on. Let me just check if I could do that. Uh, uh, Pratichi, would you mind telling me how to do that? Because this is something that you could have told me earlier. I'm not very sure how this works. Uh, if you know how to... I mean, I, I guess you mean the subtitles, right? So if you know how to bring no. the subtitles in, I'm not very sure. I, I, that I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, one of the students she says she, she would do well to get a CC because she has a slight hearing issue. Uh, so I'm just trying, just give, give it a second, please. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't really see any such option here. Uh, there are sometimes options on YouTube, but and there might be options on Zoom too, but it's not showing anything. So we'll have to get started, I'm afraid. Can't really wait too much about that for that. Okay, so uh, Jean-Michel, would you like to stop sharing for a second? Yes, before yes, yes. This I will, I will do that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. That's it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And could I also request everyone to switch on their video for a while? As you know, there are certain rules and regulations for this course. And this is the moment where I take a screenshot of uh, all of you together. And this works as a kind of attendance for the Gyan course. This is something that I've been asked to do. So I would request everyone, unless there's a huge difficulty to please switch on your videos for a second. While I quickly take a, a screenshot and, and, and we go and of course, feel free to switch off your videos if you like afterwards. Okay, some more faces, please. Okay, very warm welcome, by the way, to the course. I'm sorry to be a little coercive with the video here, but this is again, as you know, part of the, the process. Okay, perfect. Just give me a second and we'll be done with this. Okay, perfect. Uh, now feel free to switch off your videos if you like, but of course you could keep it on. It's up to you. Uh, this is going to be live streamed. It is in fact currently being live streamed on a YouTube channel, again, according to the specifications and regulations of the Gyan course. Okay, a uh, very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us here. Of course, who have registered for the course and joining here on Zoom, and also to everyone who's joining on YouTube. Uh, thank you very much for registering for this uh, course. And let me first introduce you to Professor Jean-Michel Rabate, the instructor for this course. And let me first of all, thank him uh, profusely and sincerely for doing this, because it's, it's actually a very rare opportunity for all of you. I'm sure most of you would be more than acquainted with his work. It's a very rare opportunity for all of us, in fact, to learn from him, to learn from one of the absolute doyens of modernist studies, someone who has been historically uh, in that sense, uh, a, a real, uh, a very active member of the entire 
continental philosophy scenario and, and the circle, so to speak. Uh, someone whose name uh, has appeared in so many historical documents associated with critical theory and uh, European modernism. And it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor for all of us to be able to host him, even though virtually uh, it would have been great to have him here, which was the original plan. But then pandemic completely changed the world. We got delayed by a couple of years. This course was supposed to happen two years back, uh, just for everyone's information. And we had to turn with virtual for various reasons. And, and with, with due apologies, just to continue to maybe a more formal introduction, though Professor Rabate truly uh, does not need an introduction, I'll still do the honors. Uh, he's a professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the founders and curators of Slot Foundation mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Wow. He's one of the managing editors of the Journal of Modern Literature. Since 2008, he has been a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, professor Rabate has uh, authored and edited more than 40 books on modernism, psychoanalysis, contemporary art, philosophy, and writers like Beckett, Pound, and Joyce. I'm just going to name a few from this illustrious list. Uh, Laco Literario, 2007, uh, 1913, The Cradle of Modernism. Again, 2007, it had a Chinese translation in 2013. The Ethic of the Lie, uh, Eta Doné, a handbook of modernism studies. Uh, 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 Crimes of the Future, 2014, the Cambridge Introduction to Literature and Psychoanalysis, again in 2014. The Pathos of Distance, 2016. Uh, the Cambridge Introduction to Literature and Psychoanalysis in 2014, uh, Understanding Derrida, Understanding Modernism, 2019, Knott's Post-Lacanian Readings of Literature and Film, 2020, Beckett and Saad, 2020, and uh, more recently, Historical Modernisms, Time, History, and Modernist Aesthetics, and the, and, and the book on, on James Joyce, Eretik e Prodike. So, I mean, as you can see, this is a, a, a lifetime of work. And I'm so happy to have Professor Rabate here talking about, and he'll be delivering this uh, five-day Gyan course on uh, Derrida and modernism and how to use deconstruction in the context of modernism, which I think is, of course, not only a very rich research area, but also a very useful area for all of us, for students, all of you early uh, career researchers, scholars, PhD students who would be interested in uh, looking at the practical aspect of using theoretical frameworks for various readings of literature. And this course will be a demonstration of sorts for that. So with that, I will give it over to Professor Rabate uh, and, and welcoming you again, sir. And, and yeah, over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Arka. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person, but these days we know it's complicated. And I hope next time I'll be there. So um, I'm just going to insist indeed, as Arka has mentioned, on the pedagogical aspect of my presentations, lectures, and I hope discussions. So feel free to use the chat uh, section, uh, chat box, and ask questions at, at the end of each hour. I'll stop a little before, and I'll take a few questions. So any question is welcome. And I'll begin by sharing my screen and I hope it works. Uh, yes, I think you, you can use that now. I will share. Can, can you see that cover? Just maybe just give it a second. No. Uh, Still not. Maybe not. Not okay. yet. Could so, you try once more? Yeah. So, not working. That should work. That should work. Yeah, now it's working. Now, yes. now you see. Okay. Yeah. So, this is, I, I wanted to begin with this. This is uh, the first uh, book I wrote on Derrida, and I will use some of it, but it is in French, as you can see. Les, Les Guerres de Derrida, and it is a book I uh, wrote in 2016 at the invitation of Jeanette Michaud, a very old friend and good friend from Montreal, University of Montreal, where I taught after I taught in France for a while. And it's a book 
that uh, gives a little the dynamism of my talk this morning uh, about this idea of war in, in Derrida that I will try to develop. This was followed by uh, this second book I edited on Derrida. You, you, you can see it, right? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so after Derrida, literature, theory and criticism in the 21st century, uh, uh, 2018, uh, that I did for Cambridge University Press. And there again, as you can see, the subtitle Literature, Theory and Criticism in the 21st Century. My main question was how to use Derrida's ideas, uh, how to make sense of them and not historicize them in a sort of antiquarian manner. Uh, and I will, uh, for a number of lectures, use essays that were I edited there, and I uh, liked that collection. And then it was followed by a slightly and a very different collection that you can see here. I cannot make it bigger and happily. I don't know why, um, which is, ah, yes, here you see. Understanding Derrida, understanding modernism. I will also use two texts from that collection. As you can see, it's a slightly different angle. The angle is modernism, but this is an issue we'll discuss today and also in the next days. I like the cover of this uh, collection. It comes from the work of an artist and uh, I would say actually architect. I admire Livius Woods who died some 10 years ago. And uh, I feel it exemplifies relatively well deconstruction in its uh, almost utopian, messianic and apocalyptic aspects. And um, this is what I uh, wanted to begin with by saying simply that in uh, my case, uh, I uh, have to say that I had the great luck of being Derrida's student at the Ecole Normale Supérieure and that started in 1968-69, and it has uh, gone on uh, all the rest of my life. I kept in touch with him when he would come to the United States, and uh, even after he heard that he was dying of uh, cancer, we, he, I admired his energy, and for four years he struggled, and we would then meet a lot, often in Paris or in New York or in California. My first uh, presentation will aim at giving a sense of historical context for one of Derrida's main questions, that is, what is literature? What is the function of literature? And what is writing? And in order to understand the French context, I'll start with a text that most people who are students, at least in Europe, know, which is Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, What is Literature? And uh, we, I hope you can see it here. Uh, are you seeing the, the text? Yes? Yes. 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 Good. So, uh, why Sartre? We will see at the end of this week that, in fact, even though we often do not see Derrida and Sartre as contemporaries, of course, Sartre was much older, uh, but they came from the same institution, Economal Supérieure, and Sartre has, uh, I would say, marked the 20th century. And uh, in a sense, uh, we'll see with the last book, Gla, Derrida is responding to Sartre about Genet. Here at the beginning, at the outset, I'll just summarize rapidly Sartre's ideas. And I would say that like Derrida, Sartre, but in a very different manner, is a literary philosopher. As you may know, he became famous with a novel, Nausea, uh, written before. Uh, 1938, 
And then one can say that existentialist, existentialism was invented in that novel. That's a beautiful novel, still very readable today. And then Star went on writing a lot of philosophy and excellent novels. So when Derrida started writing in the 60s, Star was very much a presence in France. He died in 1981 and <clears throat> very political very neo-Marxist. And this is what one sees in that famous essay uh, book, What is Literature and Insight? What is Writing? So I want to uh, show this because you, as you can see, uh, uh, he, he rejects the position of Giraudoux, a previous writer who's been forgotten today, I have to say. The only concern is finding the style, the idea, comes afterwards, but he was wrong. The idea did not come, on the contrary. And basically, in that uh, book, Sartre is insisting on what will remain his main idea, the idea that one writes for somebody and one writes in a political manner, and that, as he says, art has never been on the side of the purists, if that is the principle of engagement. And here he nuances it a little bit, but fundamentally one can say that <clears throat> commitment, engagement is Sartre's main idea. Every literature is political literature. When one writes whether one wants on it or not, one is committed, one betrays one's social class. And we can see here Sartre a line, as he would say, as a fellow traveler of the Communist Party, as he was just after the Second World War. He took a lot of distance in 1956, uh, but still remained in his language very close to a certain Marxism, existentialism as a humanism, and a humanist Marxism that would be more or less where he would stand. When in the so the second text I want to mention is Roland Barthes. Here you see him, I guess you have seen him before, but I'll mention this uh, text from Writing the Gris Zero. <clears throat> and uh, this little text I uh, mentioned uh, and on Writing the Gris Zero, 1947. Uh, just after Bart had published his, uh, 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 Bart had started publishing a few reviews, and then he put them together. And writing the Rizero uh, was a rejection of Sartrean's idea, Sartre's ideas. And as you can see here, um, he quotes at the beginning of that book the revolutionary. Uh, papers, newspapers of Le Père Duchesne. Le Père Duchesne was Hébert, and Hébert, to signal that he was, at the time of the French Revolution, would have these obscenities in his style. This, for Roland Barthes, is what he calls writing, écriture. I have to mention the fact that some of you may have verified that when Writing the Gris Zero was first translated into English. The translators hesitated to translate écriture, writing, as writing in English. Why? They felt it was not exactly the mode of writing, but it is, in fact, writing. So I want to credit Barth with this idea that against Sartre, who was stuck in the old dichotomy of form, content, do you have a new form, do you have a new style, you need to have something to say, that was his main question, and what is your something, is it political enough or not? Barth introduces that third term between style see, and literature, which is how Sartre had somehow simplified things by saying there is either style or the literary commitment of the author. <clears throat> so what he uh, says, uh, I'll just read, 
placed at the center of the problematics of literature, which cannot exist prior to it, writing is thus essentially the morality of form, the choice of that social area within which the writer elects to situate the nature of his language. <clears throat> These terms are very important. And I'm, I'll go fast here. But see, first it was published just after What is Literature by Sartre. Then Barth, by inserting a third term, uh, inserts history. As you can see for uh, Barth, literature and style are both partly ahistorical. Why? Literature is a big system. And once an author is inscribed in that system, she or he cannot really work with it. You take it as it is. In the same way, style is the writer's body, as he says. Like we can say, Proust has long sentences, and we re can recognize these sentences, whether they have something to do with Proust's asthma or not. That is debatable. But if one can recognize a style, it is like recognizing a face, recognizing a body. A body appears, therefore, not as a sort of endless choice, but as a definite fate, something that has been chosen for you. Writing is not only a space of freedom, but the morality of form, the choice of that social area within which the writer elects to situate the nature of his language. So you see, the important thing is this for Barth. For Barth, the question, instead of speaking of commitment, engagement, literature engagée, that for Sartre would be more on the ethical and political side, for Barth, the commitment was to choose a certain writing. Uh, and this writing is the morality of form. Uh, that is, uh, as I, so Sartre kept two terms, but adding a third term, he escaped from the conceptual deadlock of, you could say, common sense. Common sense would say literature is form and content. And no, he said there is writing in between. Um, at the same time, one of the issues here, writing took over many features attributed to style. And this is one of the slight problems of Barth's conception. The, uh, what does he do with style? However, we know, and this is my third text that I want to uh, discuss here, that uh, Barth, um, had presented so the moment, the first moment when Bart and Derrida met. They apparently they had met a little bit in Paris, but it was in the US in 1966. And that is a fantastic collection, uh, the Johns Hopkins Conference on uh, the Human Sciences, in which one can say deconstruction and structuralism were presented for the first time to Americans, which confused them no end. <clears throat> Bart uh, gave a talk, and the talk was interestingly entitled to write an intransitive verb, which is also what we're discussing. However, uh, in that, uh, and you, I hope you can see it, uh, he, what he's trying to discuss uh, is the fact that you could write as such, not write something, but be writing. How often now uh, do we hear in conversations, at least in more or less intellectual circles, what is he doing? He's writing. The passage from the verb to write, transitive, or I write something to you, to the verb to write, intransitive, is certainly the sign of an important change in mentality. I want to credit this to Barth. He understood in 66 that writing could become a pure activity without a necessary object. And 
you have this long analysis. Uh, uh, you can take a look. Meye uh, Bervenis, he analyzes the uh, many ways in which a verb can be intransitive. And it's a little complicated because he uses French examples to go, I have been, I came back. And he talks about verbs and tenses, the passé composé, present perfect in French, je suis sorti, il est mort. And in passing, curiously, in that discussion of, you might say, the syntax of to write intransitively, he mentions, so, je suis sorti, il est mort, I went out, or he died, parenthesis, for I can't say I am dead. And uh, he uh, uh, then goes on, je suis né, il est mort, elle est close, and he concludes, the case of the Prussian narrator is exemplary, he exists only in writing. One can say that this was a moment when Bart was coming closer to Telquel, Philippe Solers, who was also at that time a friend of Derrida, and that in the avant-garde movement of Telquel, there was this agreement that indeed writing was a pure exercise, was an intransitive activity. And here I see a little mistake. Uh, just after this long talk by Roland Barthes, and one might have expected Derrida to be happy with Barthes' presentation, and one can assume that this idea of writing as an intransitive activity fitted his own theory. In fact, Derrida disagreed. Why? Because uh, uh, Jacques Derrida has a long question. I also think, as Bart said, that present day literature is an attempt not really to return to a buried experience under the name of the middle voice, but to think the adventure that was Western history, the history of metaphysics. So you see here, as uh, we can imagine, Derrida takes a more philosophical view. The history of metaphysics is, of course, a sort of Heideggerian tag. And Derrida takes distance with this idea of the middle voice, a grammar of the intransitive verb. And it, if there is that history, it would be in agreement with what we've heard this evening and what was said about je suis mort, I am dead, reminding me, this is Derrida speaking, of that extraordinary story of Poe about Mr. Valdemar, who awakens at a certain moment and says, I am dead. And so this is where Derrida explains his disagreement. And it is a disagreement as to what one could draw from Benveniste, who was a famous linguist, uh, between the opposing discursive time, historical time. Uh, Derrida is trying to, to assert that one can say, I am dead. And uh, he, uh, as you can see in that paragraph, uh, you say that when I use je, I, it is always new in a D for me, but not for the reader or the hearer, quence the irreducible dissymmetry of language. However, I wonder if for me, the je is not always repeated in order to be language. And if consequently, when I pronounce the word je, I, I am not dealing with absolute original singularity. I am always already absent from my language, absent from the supposed experience of the new, of singularity, and so on. And I skip a bit. If the repetition is original, that means that I am not dealing with a new lineage in language. You were reticent about saying, I am dead. I believe that the condition for a true act of language is my being able to say, I am dead. So here, I think we 
reach the nexus of the contradiction between a certain use of linguistics. And I have to say that I remember very well when I was a student and when I was starting to see Derrida every week, we had a sort of tutorial for one year. I was still very much in that Bartesian culture of linguistics. In the 60s, in Europe, at least in France, linguistics was a key discourse, and we assumed that we needed to know everything about the linguistics of enunciation. Enunciation was the uh, what uh, Benveniste had described after Roman Jacobson as the use of shifters. I would be a shifter of the present use of a sentence. I would allow me to insert myself as a subject in my sentence. If I say I, I am in my sentence. And there was a sort of obvious idea that there is not only an apparatus allowing me to say I, but that if I say I, I am present in my statement. Or if somebody said I at a certain point, he has been present. Derrida, as you can see here, insists on something we would not take at all as relevant when discussing the use of language, which is this idea of repetition. The repetition, which is that we learn how to say I, if not, uh, and uh, as we know, certain languages do not use the I. And Derrida had meditated on the way, for instance, in Descartes, uh, cogito ego sum, uh, I think, therefore, I am. Uh, it's quite important to remember that for Descartes, cogito uh, is the Latin verb. And if we think in Latin, we do not think exactly as in English, I think, but in Latin you say cogito, meaning I think. We do not use I to say cogito, but for Descartes, cogito means ego, ego. So, whereas if you translate this into French or in English, je pense, donc je suis, I think, therefore I am. You already have the I. What Derrida is pointing out is that the logic of Latin is different from the logic of French. And so uh, he, uh, Derrida uh, goes on with Husserl, and you see how his reference change in a way again. Uh, is moving into a world in which the main references are Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, not the uh, references to Jacobson, Baveniste, and the linguists that Barth was using at that time. He's here opposing a meaningless uh, uh, expression. The worm is oof, doesn't make sense. Uh, but I can say I am dead. This is not unintelligible. This is a perfectly okay sentence. And it is a possibility. He concludes here, I am dead is not only a possible proposition for one who is known to be living, but the very condition for the living person to speak is for him to be able to say significantly, I am dead. And I think Derrida is totally right here. At least in French, we often say, I am dead, meaning I am dead beat, I am very tired, I'm exhausted, and so on. We know it's not literal. We're not saying, I am dead, because we are dead but it is a possibility of language. And so he ends this very, uh, I would say, aggressive uh, question to Barth. Uh, there is a pacte de parole, and he looks here, as you can see, to Hippolyte. Hippolyte was a friend of Derrida and became the head of the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Um, he was an excellent philosopher who had translated Hegel, and uh, uh, in, in that sense, you can see that Derrida is shifting the ground fundamentally 
taking it from Roland Barthes, who, if you look at the debate, if you're interested, the it's online, the Johns Hopkins conference, it's such a fascinating moment, I have to say. And take a look if you want to understand the history of literary criticism, at least in the United States. Uh, you can see that you have two discourses that cannot understand each other. That is that Bar doesn't know what to answer. He doesn't have the same culture. He doesn't have the same library. He hasn't read Husserl. He rarely mentions Heidegger just in passing. And he cannot understand from his linguistic point of view why I am dead is possible. And so uh, I want here to uh, insist upon the fact that what we see is a momentous shift. And again, I want to insist on this, the fact that um, Roland Barthes and Derrida were together in Baltimore. And there was, of course, Lacan as well. And then we'll return to this the very important moment when we know that Lacan and Derrida actually met in Baltimore. And uh, this time, one can say there was no aggressive question from Derrida when Lacan gave his talk. We don't know whether he attended it. But I'll uh, continue here by saying this, that much later, much later, after Bart had died, Derrida wrote a very beautiful text called The Deaths in the Plural of Roland Bart. Uh, it is in that collection on mourning that is so interesting. And uh, uh, this is a scan, sorry, I couldn't find it as an online text. And Derrida returns to writing the Gris Zero. And he explained that he had read it, but uh, he, so when he writes about that, it's a sort of long meditation and obituary on Bart, and he meditates on the function of death in Roland Bart. And he begins with his first book, Writing the Gris Zero. Derrida, uh, says, I had, for quite different reasons, postponed reading these two books, the first and the last. As if he hadn't read it. I think he had read it, but he reread it. First, writing the Gris Zero, I understood better its force and necessity beyond all that had previously turned me away from it, meaning that he didn't like it. And it was not only because of the capital letters, the connotations, the rhetorics, and all the signs of an era from which I had then thought I was taking leave, sorti, I was exiting, and from which it seemed necessary to take and rescue writing. Okay. So it means that when Derrida started thinking, basically he was aware that he didn't want to follow in the steps of Bart. Uh, necessary to take rescue, rescue writing, uh, same term. Sortir l'écriture, like extract writing from the Bartesian conceptualization. But in this book of 1953, and in those of Blanchot, to which he often refers us, the movement that I awkwardly and mistakenly call the taking leave or the exit is underway. Derrida is mentioning something that I have to say indeed when I first read Writing the Gris Zero a long time ago, because of this linguistic title, Writing the Gris Zero, in which Bart is trying to talk about the new, the nouveau roman. And uh, in linguistic terms, one forgets that one constant reference is to Maurice Blanchot, to whom we will have to return. And uh, it's clear that neither I nor Bart, I'm sorry, nor Derrida, had seen that Bart had in fact taken a number of cues from Maurice Blanchot. And if you know writing Degree Zero, the concept of the neuter that uh, Bart uh, develops is predicated 
on Maurice Blanchot. Then, as Derrida goes on, the first and the last book, Camera Lucida, are fortunate titles, a terrible fortune vacillating terribly between chance and predestination. And he talks about the sadness of someone who never renounced any pleasures, jouissance, but so to speak, treated himself to all of them. I don't know whether you know that beautiful book, Camera Lucida, a book of mourning as well, a book that Bart wrote about the death of his mother. And one can say that Bart never survived his mother. He let himself die, uh, having just been hit by a truck in Paris, but basically he had nothing special and he died like that. And so this theme of death in Bart is very important when you read Camera Lucida. And indeed, it's as if Bart had been caught up in Derrida's problematics of death. And uh, this is what you have in that text. Huh? The, uh, uh, when Derrida goes back to Bart, uh, uh, the novel is a death. He finds in Bart all those references to death. And of course, not only in Camera Lucida, but also in writing Degree Zero. And so here, uh, I'll just go faster because I want to uh, reach a, a more general statement from Derrida, but he refers to the punctum, the theory that uh, Bart puts forward in Camera Lucida, this idea that any photograph has, can be found to have a punctum, or at least a good photograph, an interesting photograph, as a punctum, that is a point that points to me, but as, the, as Bart adds in a very Derridian fashion, points to my death fundamentally. I am hit by the photograph that can show to me that death inhabits photography. And so that's the surprising conclusion of this last book by Roland Bart. And that, this is my third scan from the book. Fundamentally, uh, there, Derrida returns to uh, uh, a text I had never read before. He says, Analyse textuelle d'un conte d'Edgar Poe. And it is the moment, it's of course a text later after Baltimore, showing that Bart had heard Derrida and analyzed that impossible sentence. I am dead, dead. Uh, I am dead is by no means the incredible statement, but much more radically the impossible utterance. Uh, and uh, Derrida goes back to it. Would the impossible utterance, I am dead, really never have taken place? Uh, he's right when he says that literally according to the letter. So you see here, uh, Derrida returns to the same discussion he had with Bath, but shows that Bath, at the end of his life, had he gone on, had a different language that would use the punctum and that would use this utterance, I am dead, and would make it part of his own critical idiom. Which leads us to uh, this uh, more general idea that in uh, uh, Bart and in Derrida, uh, there is this idea of a death in language. I want to insist on this because one may wonder why this insistence on death, why is that? And so lead to my um, last statement here, um, which is the fact that when Derrida is looking at language as writing, he doesn't mean it in the same way as Bart. For Bart, writing is a certain activity of the writing subject. The writing subject may just be letting her hand use any kind of instrument, a keyboard, a pen, and 
let's ink uh, spatter the page and it can be a drawing as well. So Derrida, who thinks more philosophically, more ontologically, one might say, writing is that kind of inert machine, the ink of my uh, typewriter, <laughs> the ink of my pen or my, uh, my computer, my printer. See, these are dead, inert things. So writing is on that material side. One can say that writing has struck with death in that sense that is inorganic. It's not the living present of the subject. However, writing is a sort of precondition for all the repetitions that make language language, that we learn to say I at a certain moment and so on. And so this leads Derrida to this notion that his analysis is perhaps less historical than it could appear. And I wanted to return to this notion that Barth had that writing is a space of history because it is the moment when the subject is inserting herself or himself in uh, a social context. However, uh, for uh, Derrida, and one has to be aware of this, there is first this notion that some of his earliest intuitions are found in Plato or Descartes. So you could say, dead philosophers who've been dead a long time, but for Derrida, we need to take their thinking into account. We cannot just bypass them. And this is why in uh, a conversation with Christopher Norris, Christopher Norris was trying to make Derrida uh, say or answer is deconstruction and Derrida always identified with deconstruction, is it a modernist practice of criticism or a post-modernist practice? And we know how often Derrida was called a post-modern, post-modernist. Um, and this is why, again, I wanted to insist on the 1966 moment, uh, because the 1966 moment was seen as the moment when a certain French structuralism, represented at that time by Lacan and Barth, was attacked by a certain French post-structuralism, represented by Derrida. These are not terms that the French would use, but the Germans and the American would use, and the British, post-structuralism. Deconstruction would be post-structuralist, and Indeed, one can say that it is, I would, if it's not a term I use personally, but I could say it's not wrong at all to say that deconstruction is post-structuralist because it takes stock of structuralism and it works with structuralism and it questions certain presuppositions of structuralism. However, Derrida answers, I don't think deconstruction is something specifically modern. There are some modern features of what we identify as deconstruction in some academic context, but what makes deconstruction unavoidable has been at work for a long time, even with Plato or Descartes. And uh, Norris was trying to go back to a certain problematics that would be that today associated with Habermas, trying to see whether Kant was the first modern philosopher or the first modernist philosopher, and whether Derrida could be aligned with philosophers like Lyotard and Baudrillard, who explicitly associated themselves with postmodernism, uh, a program presenting itself as a critique of the Enlightenment. Derrida refused to accept that. And again, he says this, I wouldn't want to call deconstruction a critique of modernity. Neither it is modern or in any sense a glorification of modernity. It is very premature to venture this generalization, this concept of period. 
I would say I just don't know what these category, categories mean. For me, they are not rigorous concepts. And so uh, it is interesting and indeed, so this was perhaps the aim of the collection on Derrida and modernism. One of the conclusions we all reached was that if you read Derrida in the context of what we call modernism, meaning the first half of the 20th century, more or less, and experimental important literature in English mostly, uh, but it's not limited to the English speaking world, uh, modernism is a certain moment, a certain historical period. When did it begin? When did it end? These are complex issues and what could go back to them. But fundamentally for Derrida, these categories, modernist or postmodernist, are not rigorous. And indeed, we know they are not. That may be why they've been so successful. But however, for him, so this is the surprising next step. Uh, he thinks that one category that can be discussed rigorously is that of literature. Literature can be first historicized and has a precise meaning. I quote this, as you can see, I've often found myself insisting on the necessity of distinguishing between literature, ballads, or poetry. Literature is a modern invention inscribed in convention and institutions which, to hold on to this trait, secures in principle the right to say everything. Literature ties its destiny to a certain non-censure, to the space of democratic freedom, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. No democracy without literature, no literature without democracy. I insist on this because it's a very important statement of Derrida. As you can see, what is modern is not modernism or postmodernism, vague schools, but literature as such, which is not poetry, which is not bellet. Uh, uh, and it is, you might say, an ethical statement. And here I am tempted to think again of how Barth would talk about the morality of form. Although, as you can see, the language has changed a lot here. Uh, why is this uh, idea of a freedom connected with democracy? And maybe one could say perhaps as well through the French Revolution, because the right to say everything, as you may know, was a requirement that Marquis de Sade had been the first to make when he said that literature has the right to say everything, meaning that there should be no censorship. And if you want to describe an orgy or tortures, you can do it. And you can describe the beheading of the king as well. All this within the context of the French Revolution. However, for Derrida, literature is the deployment of a problematic that is that of writing. And that problematic goes back to Plato. Plato famously, and we could return to it, uh, something that has been discussed quite often, uh, condemned writing in Phaedrus. Uh, why? Because for Plato, literature has enormous defects, a refusal to submit to the authority of the king of the, or the father. The literature, the, the writing is in the side of errancy, it cannot be mastered by any dominant system. Literature, like writing, implies an anarchic rebelliousness and ends up demanding democratic egalitarianism. It was indeed what Plato was afraid of in Phaedrus. He wanted to reassert the authority of the king, of the father, and rejected this anarchic rebellion of the sons. And so, one can say that if one wants to historicize really, and this is what Derrida is suggesting, one needs to go back to 
a certain a historical sense or earlier sense of the concept of writing and this is plato who famously uh, uh, saw this and see how it is connected with a certain moment in which we are uh, one can say uh, this is uh, i return to this uh, here uh, he, he said that uh, so saying the right to say everything is uh, something I want to uh, say what has been also a point made after Derrida by Jacques Rancière in a book uh, that owes a lot to Derrida, although Derrida is not credited, Mute Speech. Uh, if you know Rancière, Rancière goes exactly in the same way showing that literature appears he would say a little earlier than Derrida in the classical age in the 17th century and becomes more and more independent at the end of the 19th century Rancière takes Victor Hugo Notre Dame de Paris 1831 as exemplifying this new autonomy of language uh, and one can say that for Rancière or uh, uh, others, uh, it's the condition of saying everything that is a certain modernity. Uh, we will see that this is also the question of Blanchot. Uh, Blanchot also insisted on this. The essence of literature is precisely to escape any essential determination. Uh, literature is limitness and so on. We return to this when we discuss Blanchot. I don't want to be too long here. And if you have any question, please do not hesitate to uh, ask uh, them. Let me see whether- If, uh, if there's a have... question uh, from anyone, thank you Jean-Michel so much. You're welcome. Uh, if, if there's a question from anyone, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak, or you could put it in the chat box. So far, I don't see anything. But if there's anything you would like to ask him about this, you know, very, uh, in a sense, uh, a historically situated, but a very conceptually rich movement that he was talking about, also a movement or a shift in the very idea of writing uh, and, and the relation between writing and the subject who does the writing, and a sort of slow, maybe withering away of that subject as well with the idea of the neuter coming in or this exactly. idea of the, the sort of transitive, intransitive writing that, that uh, Ramishal was talking about. So is there any question at this point? We could pause a little bit, have some questions, and then we could go into the second hour. Well, I think we, we can, what I suggest is we can leave the question for next time make a, a, a five minutes pause sure. Sure. and then we'll we'll return and then think about all this and we can since i want to talk about a more historical context but we could return to the first question i know it takes some time to yes. Yes. Uh, uh, elaborate a question but uh, yeah. don't feel uh, embarrassed uh, any any question, naive questions are good. I, 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 I welcome any any question, but I, I suggest we take a just yes. for so that people can have a little drink and uh, yes. five minutes, and then we come back in 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 five minutes. Sure, sure. Let's take a bio break. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we need to take a break, whatever. <laughs> so in, in in five minutes, I'll just uh, mute my video. As we take this break, I mean, feel free to stretch yourselves, maybe use the washroom, come back again in five minutes. And if you have questions that you would like to put in the chat box, if there's some problem with the audio, please feel free to do that in the next five minutes. We can come back to the questions in the chat box later. Okay, thank you. 
And just to let the participants know, um, if you look at your shared Google Drive folder, the discussion that just happened in the first hour is in a way synoptically mentioned in the first slide. So if you go to the lecture one subfolder within lecture wise handouts, this is the first slide, uh, the first word document, sorry, called Derrida Bath 1966. And this offers a sort of overview of what Professor Rabati was talking about in this first hour. So we'll move on to the other documents and you know, uh, the way he continues to talk about it in the next couple of hours. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, there is a document summarizing some of this. And of course, the relevant texts that he's talking about are also shared with you within the same main folder, right? So please have a look there. And you can also have a look at the lecture plan to situate yourself in terms of the texts that he's talking about. And again, I would request for those who are registered to at least have a look at these texts, if possible, read them before you come to the next class. I think it will be easier for everyone to get what is being discussed if there is some you know, prior sort of acquaintance with some of these texts. Thank you. So I think we, we can resume. Sure. Uh, if everybody is is here um yes and i i see that i have a question about derrida and magical realism and um i i know about magical realism and even though it's something that derrida was aware of um i don't think he uh, ever uh wrote about it uh, I, I will return to this. Derrida's sense of uh, a literary tradition was more European in, in, in a sense. And uh, uh, even though um, someone like Blanchot was closer to some magical realism, um, it is not the kind of realism associated with Marques and uh, uh, the Derrida's culture was not very Hispanic in, in a sense. Um, and uh, whenever there is a certain magical realism in his, uh, in the text he discusses, it is more of the European style. It, it existed in, in Europe, and we could say that certain novels of uh, Blanchot could be called a time. Uh, the style is very much as like uh, the first magical realism which, as you may know, uh, didn't really start with the South American or Caribbean boom in the 1940s and 50s with Arejo Carpenter and, and, and so on, but can go back to people like Borges in Argentina in the 1930s or in Germany. There was a weird tradition of uh, magical realism in the 1930s. But these are things that Derrida uh, may have known uh, about, but didn't really uh, discuss directly. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. Um, and so Derrida, ah, that's, that's a very good question. As Derrida talks about writing and relates its material ontology to dead and inanimate things, where for Derrida that the subjective traces of the writing subject like in the written text? Yes, this is this is the key of the question. For Derrida, the key of writing is that uh, writing reminds us that language is made up of repetition. Um, as he uh, insists upon, uh, difference is conditioned by repetition and repetition is always the same like when you learn the alphabet or when you learn a language you learn words that have been used by other people and so uh, this is the key insight in Derrida uh, the fact that there is this repetition or this let's say death in language inscribes within each subject and not just in the text, but within each subject's use of language, something that precludes the identity of the subject 
with herself or himself. There is no subjective identity, and this is what literature somehow exploits. In that sense, one can say that Derrida is extremely Hegelian. If you know the beginning of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, we'll return to some Hegel much later, but more in detail uh, with Gla. Uh, but for Hegel, this is one of the discoveries of the consciousness progressing on the way to truth. Uh, consciousness discovers that if I write on a piece of paper, now it is noon, now the sun is shining, and I take the same piece of paper 12 hours later, it is not noon, the sun is not shining, which sounds completely self-evident, but is a way of saying that written language is not identical with spoken language. If we say uh, something like that, now it is noon and it is midnight, you're considered either a liar or insane. Not so with language. So there is this kind of madness of language, which has to do with its status as written, but this written uh, status destroys the idea of a trace to the living subject that would be self-evident. And uh, when, I, when I say self-evident, uh, I mean it in the most uh, radical sense, because it is precisely what Derrida was probing with Husserl. Uh, his great model was Husserl, and he shows, this was a long technical analysis of Husserl, uh, and Derrida as a student did, uh, showing that Husserl could not found philosophy on consciousness, and Husserl was dogged in his investigation of consciousness, because there was always something that resisted this kind of transparent self-evidence of consciousness to itself. You always needed, with when you were talking about consciousness, to find a sort of written verification that consciousness was really consciousness. These are questions that are classical philosophical questions. These are the questions of Descartes in the first meditation, second meditation, questions of Plato, and so on. There's very traditional questions, but Derrida always goes back to them. Uh, I noted I was so surprised by that. Uh, when he was just uh, 23, he, he wrote uh, a sort of, not even the station, an MA work, analysis of Husserl, and there's a little footnote, what a pity that Husserl had not read Plato, <laughs> which is really ferocious. <laughs> so see, that, that's what um, uh, Derrida's point. In a sense, you might say a traditionalist starting point, but the way he uses it is so subversive of everything else that then it has consequences for the links between what literature teaches us about writing, for instance, literature, is the domain in which somebody can write an autobiography and lie all the time. And you don't know. You will not know exactly. So is there another question? When Martin Derrida on Plato, the historical aspect of the literature can be understood if it can be seen in the historical way. How to understand this? Yeah, what I want to show here is, is, is this idea that for Derrida, and I would say this is true of a certain modernism, and here I am anticipating a little bit on the question of modernism, but it's a good moment to introduce it. Uh, in order to be historical, you cannot be historicist. I would put it like this. So in order to be historical, you need, so this is why he's always looking at history with a certain Heideggerian question in mind. And I would say that when he talks about history, Derrida is very Heideggerian. When I say Heideggerian, I mean this. In Heidegger, to simplify things a little bit, you always have a sort of question about the design, existence, being, question of being, 
or the forgetting of being or the difference between being and existing and so on, which you could say are structural questions. They are always true, true for everybody at every time and so on. They're not historical questions. And you have also the consideration from what you call the historicity of the occultation or forgetting of being. And this is what he calls the history of metaphysics. And Derrida accepts those analyses and shows that if we think historically, we have to think of what doesn't change. In order to understand change, we need to have a sort of kernel of unchanging truth. In the sense, the reason I am connecting this starting point with the question of modernism is because I'd say that for me, one of the best definitions of modernism was given by Baudelaire. And Baudelaire was discussing, in fact, beauty. Uh, but he said, our conception of beauty is to see that it is made up of half an eternal uh, aspect and half of a changing contemporaneous aspect that he defines by fashion, morality, and so on. And because both Baudelaire and Derrida are aware that if you are in a constant flux of historicism, you will not understand what has really changed if you don't have criteria that are unchanging, as it were. I hope uh, I've uh, uh, how to understand um, the question about consciousness exactly. See, uh, this is so what Derrida is always doing, and in a sense, one can date his thinking. His thinking, at least in France, is impacted by the rediscovery of the three German philosophers, Hegel. Husserl and Heidegger, the three H's, but Derrida notes them, articulates them in a very specific manner, each time rereading them very, very differently. And at times, one would see this, we, we, we can uh, go back to some of this by pitting them one against the other, like Heidegger against Husserl, Hegel against Heidegger, and so on. But one can say that originally, and we know that historically speaking, his credentials were uh, the work he did on Husserl first in um, Harvard on the manuscript of Husserl. So to say that Derrida was a good specialist of Husserl, but also of Heidegger. Uh, he had a very, very long confrontation with Heidegger. And I can say that in my own interactions with Derrida, uh, I, I, I noted that whenever you mention any author, he uh, would, and even if he knew them very, very well, he would defer to specialists, to people who knew better. He would pretend he didn't know enough and so on. But I noted, so even for Husserl, he recognized that there were better specialists than he was, but only for Heidegger. That he would never <laughs> accept that anybody had understood Heidegger better than he did. And one moment that when we, we didn't really have a, a, a little fight, but I can mention this in passing, because a very long time ago, I had written a very a short book on Thomas Bernhardt, uh, Austrian writer. And in that book, I quoted, I just had some fun because Thomas Bernhardt hated Heidegger and he has a parody of Heidegger and he described Heidegger as being a sort of old Nazi in the Black Forest. And Bernhardt invents a story. He imagines that Heidegger's wife, who was a Nazi and uh, a neo anti Semitic and so on, was always knitting socks for Heidegger. And when I gave that book to Derrida, I said, Thank you, Jean Michel, but no, that really, no, 
no, you cannot write that. No, you cannot. No, please, no. Really, you shocked me there. The one time I shocked Derrida was about Heidegger's socks. So that's my 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 little joke. And I realized that he was serious. So, oh, I said, no, but you know, Jacques, he just because uh, he found it funny. No, 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 no. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. See, there was that sense of, no, that, that's really too mean, too low. Uh, you cannot make fun of Heidegger. Um, and uh, as we know, uh, uh, Derrida had never rejected the imputation that Heidegger had been for a, what, a Nazi, but one should take his thinking seriously and could not make fun of it. Uh, uh, if there are no other questions for the moment, thank you very much. I think we can do like that. Um, I think it's a good way. You, you will use the chat box. I plan to return to my second section and so i'm not sure whether you had time to look at um the uh material i had given but um uh, i wanted to I, I had given you the uh biographical context um of uh, uh peter's biography I'll just open this and share my screen. I hope it works again. Uh, share my screen. Okay. Does that, that work? Share. Yeah. You, yes. Can... Okay. You, you see this? Okay. So it's a complicated issue. And I have to say, it's very surprising to see how much of French theory was produced by French people who came from Algeria. Uh, uh, one that you might not associate, the, associate with is Althusser, uh, whose family uh, came from uh, Algeria, uh, Ellen Sixou, uh, a friendship with Derrida came from the fact that both were Jews coming from Algeria. Uh, um, and uh, many, many others, uh, many French philosophers came from that part of France. Uh, as you may know, uh, it, it was a, a colonial idea. Um, uh, in the 1820s, 30s, the French started invading uh, Algeria and Morocco. There were skirmishes, but soon they more or less conquered those and, and Tunisia, but mostly Algeria, which was the biggest country, and considered these three uh, countries as French territories. There were, in all those countries, huge Jewish populations that had been there three or four centuries before the French came. So it's also important to know this. So this was uh, where Derrida's family came from. Uh, they came from what is called Sephardi families, that is, Jewish families that were expelled from Spain or, I mean, the the moment when Spain closed itself to the Jews at the beginning of the conquest of the New World, 1592. Quite a, a historical moment. And uh, uh, it, it may not be obvious for you in India, but among Jewish communities, there is a huge division between those southern Jews who were in all the parts of the Mediterranean world, and also in the south of France, and also in Italy, and the Ashkenazi, so the Jewish communities coming from Poland, from Germany, from Russia, uh, who came from the north and who had different habits and so on. And someone like Levinas, we'll talk about him, came from Lithuania, so was Ashkenazi. And uh, still today, you have really uh, huge differences, even in the way religion is practiced and so on. So I, I, I am saying this not being Jewish myself, 
uh, but it's uh, something I've observed, um, how complicated that is. And I want you to complicate a little bit this uh, story of Derrida and Camus, uh, because for me, when I, so this is what I did when I wrote my little book, Les, Les, Les Guerres de Derrida's Wars, I uh, discovered, I have to say, I had no idea of, about any of this until I read this chapter that I gave you uh, of Peter's biography that Derrida fundamentally had. So you, you, I hope you have read everything. I'm not going to go back to all, all of this and uh, the complicated story. And I would say for me as a French person, shameful story of the role of France in Algeria. And I, I, uh, I was really astonished to see Derrida's uh, rejection of uh, the book by Noah, but because I had read the book by Noah in its uh, first version. And let me put it like this. Uh, I'm going down to Bianco, Friends of Derrida, Maurice de Gandillac, Jean-Yves Polite, uh, they, I hope you have seen all that story of how um, the uh, FNL, that is the National Front uh, in Algeria, uh, was uh, fighting against the French and um, uh, Derrida had a good friend, Pierre Nora. And I would say that today in France, Pierre Nora is better known than Derrida um, as the leading historian and as having uh, launched that enormous series of places of memory, lieu de mémoire, and so on. Uh, but he was a friend of Derrida, both being Jewish, but Pierre Nora was not from Algeria, although Sephardi, uh, but he went to Algeria uh, during his military service and he published a book, The French of Algeria. Uh, it's not translated into English, and happily. And after receiving this volume, Derrida replied in a letter of 19 single spaced pages. Uh, and uh, uh, it's quite so when it's it published, now the Nora was still alive, republished his book with Derrida's letters, 40 pages. And ferocious attack on the book. And one can see so surprisingly that Derrida disagreed in extremely violently uh, with the French of Algeria. I was so surprised by this because to me, as most, let's say, French people on the left, I thought Nora was right. The French of Algeria is a sort of indictment of the colonial system and um, also accuses Albert Camus of having hedged his bets and being a little uncertain um, about what to do and so on. And the key, in a way, is for Nora a rejection of what I would call the liberal position among the French settlers in Algeria. And one can say that Nora had a sort of Marxist analysis showing that the French were in fact uh, exploiting the population, which I think is quite true. Um, and so he agreed completely, Nora, with the hard line of the nationalist front of Algerian liberation and thought that independence was not only needed but inevitable and um, when the French should just leave and let Algeria uh, uh, 
be, be in charge, which happened after a war that killed many people and that was in fact a little like the Vietnam War in uh, America. Uh, it had been won, you might say, there's a fantastic Italian film some of you may have seen, the, the Battle of Algiers, uh, uh, that ends when the French corner the militants of the FNL and kill them. And indeed they were uh, winning, but the public opinion in France had turned completely and people were uh, totally fed up with that war in which quite a number of young French men were killed. And then there was this backlash with the extreme right OIS bombing people in France. Many of my friends, when I was a student, had been in the past, uh, their apartments had been bombed. It was, they would use plastic and many people were killed like that, a little randomly. They would plastic put plastic on the doors or the mailboxes of people who were on the left. So there was a sort of quasi-civil war in Paris, in France. And so de Gaulle arrived and he had a fantastic movement by he came as being the candidate of the right and he turns against the right and he granted independence to Algeria. It is in that context that Derrida writes this extraordinary letter to his friend. And one can see that Derrida, A, defends the position of Albert Camus. And one thing that uh, he uh, rejects is this imputation that Camus had condoned the practice of torture um, that was used by the French army. And we know, we know that this was indeed something, and I, again, uh, I'm quite ashamed of this, huh? that the French army was practicing a lot and uh, they, actually also tortured all the communist leaders who were found in the French army, but they mostly tortured Algerian militants and anybody who was a suspect. And Camus, as Derrida says, and that Derrida is right, had never condoned torture. On the contrary, he had accused people of using torture. Uh, but Derrida goes on by criticizing Nora for suggesting that the average income of French Algerians was higher than French people in France. Uh, um, and he's trying to discuss the colonial system. And basically, one can say that Derrida, who, of course, had been raised in Algeria and knew exactly who the people were, is trying to say to his old friend, to his school friend, you don't know the complexity of the social situation. And indeed, if you know a little bit about Albert Camus, so very famous writer, Albert Camus, uh, when in Algeria, lived in absolute poverty. Uh, he was, his mother was a single mother, absolutely no money, and he had to rely on journalism to make a living. Derrida's family was not very well off, although they were a little better off, but they felt that they were not profiteers, as it were. And uh, Nora tends, in a way, to put all the French in a sort of single category, category of colonial exploiters, and so on. But as Derrida said, uh, says, um, uh, one of the main objections is how Nora discusses the stranger. Um, the stranger, uh, and he agrees with Nora, I've always read this book as an Algerian book. Okay. I want to insist on this because we forget uh, what I was describing earlier via Roland Barthes, and I didn't insist too much on this, and it may have been obvious for some of you, but this concept of writing degree zero. Uh, 
what is Bart's example for writing degree zero? The style of the stranger. The first sentence of the stranger uh, in which we have a sort of passé composé that was only at that time in spoken language uh, and in which the narrator speaks uh, Merceau in his own voice about the death of his mother and so on. Uh, very important to realize that this book that still remains, I would say, one of the classics of French literature. Why? Because it's easy to read. You can read The Stranger uh, without knowing much French. It's written without much style, but it's a beautiful story, very gripping and very open-ended in which we have one character called Merceau, who is not particularly racist, not particularly on the right or on the left, who seems to be completely lost after the death of his mother, who he doesn't know why one day kills an Arab on a beach and is condemned to death. What Nora, who analyzes it at some length, uh, insists upon uh, is that for the French, the scandal was that a Frenchman was condemned to death for the murder of an Arab. He insinuates that at that time, normally Merceau would have been freed. Uh, in Camus' uh, complex analysis, Merceau accepts his punishment and accepts that he's going to be executed. Uh, so what is very interesting is to see Derrida uh, uh, to say uh, Camus must be credited with a pure and clear intention. He wants to save Camus. I want to insist on this because in my youth, because of Sartre and because of the clash between Sartre and Camus, uh, uh, as you know, they were in a sort of friendship at first and then very soon rivalry. Why? Because Camus was trying to think through a sort of different ethics. Camus was less close to the Communist Party as Sartre was. Nora was very close to the Communist Party. And uh, Camus was rejected as trying to be in the middle. And one can see a Derrida who also feels he is in the middle. And uh, uh, see, he, uh, uh, yes, uh, now I, I, I will quote this essay, Liberalism and the Algerian War, the case of Jacques Derrida, uh, Edward Bering, who'd written an excellent book on the youth of Derrida, uh, provides a detailed analysis of Derrida's attitude to the Algerian war, comparing this letter to Nora with a piece of history. Uh, and um, if we go along with Bering's view, the attitude and conception of the future author of monolingualism of the other remained for a long time those of a colonist. Uh, and he refers to the fact that Derrida did not sign the manifesto of the 121 in 1960. Uh, I, I would say that this is a little disingenuous because in 1960, Derrida was really very young and nobody asked him to sign. He was a student in, 19, in 1960. So, uh, but Indeed, someone like Maurice Blanchot was one of those who signed this manifesto. We know that Beckett did not sign it because he was afraid he might be obliged to leave France if he signed a manifesto against the war in Algeria. Uh, but uh, in uh, this uh, analysis by, uh, and I'll, I'll show you, the rest of the essay by Bering, um, if I can't find it, uh, this liberalism and war. Okay, can you can you see that? Um, Bering, so you you can see it. 
Add the screen once more, Frozen. Uh, I, I need to, okay. Yeah, because it's got, it's got an it, it got, yeah, yeah, share, share screen. Uh, partager l'écran. Partager. That's it. You, you have it? Yes. 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 So, uh, if you are interested, you can find it. It's online. It's a very systematic analysis of that moment, which is for me very revealing, interesting. Uh, it shows that fundamentally, um, it was because Derrida agreed with Nora's political platform, especially the question of Algerian independence, that his defense of the liberals was so insistent. Derrida refused Nora's Cat 22 that set limits on the French Algerian liberal opposition. Basically, what Nora was saying is that given the Algerian impasse, nobody could be on the left and remain in Algeria. Derrida insisted that there should be a group of people on the left who would agree with the FLN and all the groups, the liberation groups, but that they would not have, in a way, to leave Algeria. For Derrida, one should not resist French sovereignty by directly rejecting France. He rather hoped for a Franco-Muslim community that would maintain a robust connection to France. See, so this is what Bering uh, uh, discusses as a key to uh, both Derrida and Camus' position. They try to say, and it's this pain of exile that Derrida expressed all the time, facing his past in Algeria, the wound that leaving Algeria had meant. Uh, and like Camus, who felt so enmeshed in that past when with friends who were Algerian and French and so on, uh, uh, Camus became to be seen as the colonizer of goodwill, but from their own position, they felt that they were inside their own country, as it were. And so uh, this is the question of what bearing, and so that was the term used at that time, the liberals. That is, we could say the left wing intellectuals and people of uh, who were not pure French colonials who, who were ready to hand over power to the Algerians to be somehow in a sort of home rule, a little like if we imagine today Protestants in Ireland after uh, a moment when Ireland becomes independent, it's a little the situation we might have, who knows, um, in Ulster. See, imagine if uh, by the fact that Ulster would join the rest of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, all the Protestants of Ulster were obliged to go back to England. See, so little how they would see the situation. Uh, and um, so, he, he, uh, as uh, he says, Derrida's ethnic and socio-historical background makes his self-presentation of the French Algerian liberal plausible. He was a Sephardic Jew whose ancestors lived in North Africa long before the first French colonial expansion there in 1930. The Cremieux Decree of 1870 had granted all Jews French citizenship and all the following decades so significant moves towards assimilation. The Sephardic Jewish population may have remained cohesive and intermarriage with Christians was rare, but in terms of language, culture, and economic position, there were clear alignment with the European population. Describing his own family, Derrida said they were too colonized, too uprooted. And indeed, this is the uh, predicament that young Derrida faced, uh, and he's written a lot about this. When he was 10, during the Second World War, he was excluded from 
a French national school because this was the Vichy regime and the Vichy regime was trying to please the Nazis and they had decided that there were too many Jews at school and uh, Derrida unluckily was one of those who were expelled and he had to go home and basically at that time uh, what was um, normal for Jewish family they should have sent him to a Jewish school he did and he hated it in fact because Derrida did not identify as an orthodox Jew at all he identified as French however uh, having been expelled from the school made him realize that he was not exactly French which led him to that extraordinary statement in the monolingualism of the other uh, Derrida uh, as this sentence, I have only one language and it is not mine, meaning French, but French is not my language, but it is only my language. And so this is the uh, situation we can say, why is Derrida feeling this complicity with Camus? Camus at the time, was rejected by Sartre and all the communists and so on as a sort of deluded, beautiful soul who thought you could have peace in a time of war. I want to return to that. And indeed, there was war from the left. The FNL was bombing cafes, torturing people like the French had before. Uh, and uh from the right also people were shot tortured and so on nevertheless Derrida and Camus believe they should fight for some kind of peaceful cohabitation of the French on the left and the uh independent country this is so what Bering is uh um adding is the strange fact that Derrida didn't like talking about Algeria too much. Um, my supervisor, Ellen Sixou, had for a long time the same attitude. And it's only quite late in her life that she went back to Algeria after independence and felt for a while she could not return somehow. See, publicly, Derrida remained silent on the question of Algeria for most of his life, but Derrida allowed him to express in the personal private analysis to Nora, ne was never repeated in print. It was surprising that he never published that long letter. He, um, it was only because he had died. Uh, however, what Bering is showing, and I agree completely with him, is that in Derrida's attitude, you have a little bit the same logic as when he uh, wrote about Michel Foucault and showing that um, uh, Foucault was trying to talk about madness as the absence of language. However, Foucault was making a language about the absence of language. How could he do this? In arguing that the critique of reason could only be made from within reason. This is the main objection Derrida made against Foucault, creating a huge rift with his mentor and professor uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, Foucault was, we know, extremely wounded by Derrida's long analysis of history of madness uh, uh, in 1963. Uh, Derrida suggested in a parallel fashion that anti-colonial thinkers were only able to fully extricate themselves from Europe using European ideas. Uh, quote, the anti-colonial revolution can only liberate itself from factual Europe or the empirical West in the name of transcendental Europe, that is reason, and first win with Western values, language, sciences, techniques, and weapons an irreducible contamination or incoherence 
that no cry, I am thinking of finance, can exorcise, however pure and intransigent it may be. And so, in a sense, what um, uh, one can say that it was only in 1990s that Derrida, so close to the end of his life, started openly speaking about Algeria and uh, uh, trying to go back to presenting himself as franco magrebian And indeed, it's very interesting to see Derrida in uh, the later texts, mostly Circumfession, one of his most extraordinary autobiographical texts. Derrida presents himself as African, <laughs> see, as black almost. And indeed, I have to say, uh, uh, for a Frenchman, uh, Derrida's skin was rather swarthy. Uh, uh, so uh, he was quite aware of that. And in his family, uh, he was at times called the dark one. Uh, and so Derrida identified as not only Algerian, but Franco Maghrebian and African. He did this when comparing himself with whom Saint Augustine, Derrida reminded uh, his Catholic friends that one of the fathers of the church uh, who invented, you might say, Christianity as it is known, was an African. And that probably someone like Augustine, a saint, was probably more African than European. Uh, and so uh, this is the problematics of the monolingualism of the other. Uh, Derrida used his status as a Franco-Maghribian to explain his relationship to the French language. He was born in the French context and knew no other language apart from the French. It was what he called the, an absolute habitat defining his very relationship to the world. But at the same time, French was the language of the colonizer disciplined by the usage in Paris, not fully mastered by the Sephardic Jew, who must always defer to an external authority. And here I want to insist by opposing Derrida's situation in language to that of Heidegger. Heidegger as a sort of model of rigorous thinking in metaphysics and bringing to bear what Heidegger called destruction, um, deconstruction. Deconstruction was invented by Heidegger, one might say. However, someone like Heidegger never once doubted that German was his language and that German was the language of his people and that he was born in language and that this language could express the world, as he would say. We return to Heidegger later on. And even for Heidegger, as we know, he would assume that German was the Greek of the 20th century. Greek was the language of thinking in antiquity, not Latin, not Arabic, and so on. And German was the language of philosophy. By comparison, you can see how Derrida complicates his situation. Indeed, in his family, they only spoke French. France had granted the Jewish communities the status of nation, French nationals. They were French nationals. However, they were still seen as slightly different. And it, of course, uh, Vichy was one of those historical moments when suddenly uh, Tolerance was rejected in the name of fascism, Nazism, intolerance, racism, and so on. And Derrida was quite aware that these were issues that would flare up in any historical moment of tension, panic, and so on. At the same time, he was trying to save someone like Camus from the easy accusations, as he felt of his friends, easy Marxism that simplified everything. 
in a Marxist vision, you were either for independence or against. You were either with us or against us. And anybody who was French was an exploiter, a colonial exploiter, and so on, and had to leave. And all the, all those who had worked for them were simply guilty and had to be killed, which is what happened, as you may know. It was a terrible scandal when the French left Algeria, they left behind uh, the Arkies who were slaughtered in the hundreds of thousands, uh, things that are still today, I would say, uh, the hangover from the colonial situation in France, in the suburbs of Paris, is still there, uh, as we know from recent uh, attacks and so on. This has not been processed really. And I know that in India, there are also situations that have not been processed and so on. Derrida is aware to the complexity of those situations and insists that you could be white and from a French family, but also a poor French, and that there should be something like a cohabitation. And also what he uh, very clearly criticizes is the fact that uh, surprisingly, Nora's uh, Marxist outlook forces him to become a nationalist because he insists that only the FNL is the rightful representative of the Algerians. We know that this was a position taken by Franz Fanon himself, but uh, they were blind to the internal struggles in all the groups uh, that claimed the power after independence was granted. And if we look at the situation in Algeria today, that has not been solved either. As we know, uh, after the French left, uh, for a while, there was a moment of peace, but uh, the situation today is not looking so great. And so this is to say that this is a good example as bearing shows of how Derrida's thinking is um, a thinking about, one might say, ethics. Huh? Um, in uh, To Nora uh, uh, as well, uh, he said, um, uh, our discussion is a total disagreement. But as he adds, this disagreement is nothing for us but a certain way of agreeing together. After the fierce and passionate reaction to many of Nora's claims, Derrida refuses schism with his friend. And indeed, he remained a good friend of Nora. Uh, and so this is also, uh, this recalls a belated reconciliation a year before her. Jean-Paul Sartre, writing the obituary of his erstwhile friend, Albert Camus, referred to a squabble. It is nothing, only another way of living together, which I think is quite a remarkable expression used by Sartre, uh, uh, who, of course, Camus had died, as you may know, tragically, in a silly car crash when he had a train ticket he could have taken and he would have saved his life. Uh, uh, so it's interesting for me to see that Derrida would agree with Camus mm, against Sartre here, uh, with Barth probably, because uh, Barth like Camus, for Barth Camus had brought about a certain revolution in the idea of writing. Uh, and uh, Camus insisted that you could be both French and Algerian, and that you could not just get rid of the colonial system by believing in a new nationalism. Uh, and that if that nationalism was a sort of anti-cosmopolitan movement, then um, you were not necessarily helping history uh, progress. I'll, I'll stop here. Yes. Uh, I see that there are uh, are these new new questions. Uh... Um, 
having some network issues. Uh, just... uh, you have ne ne network. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you hear me as well. Yes. No, you, you now you, 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 you mute. Yeah, I just switched on my video because there's some work issues. Sorry. So yes. I see a question about Plato's attitude towards writing. Yes, I can return to to that. Uh, in Phaedrus, uh, Plato uh, shows the interaction. You have a, a king in Egypt. And so for the Greeks, uh, the ancient, the most ancient language was Egyptian. Egyptian hieroglyphics. They imagined that writing had been invented in Egypt. And like for the Europeans in the 17th century, they suddenly discovered Chinese uh, and they thought that Chinese was the, and I think we may agree, we don't know whether Sumerian or Chinese, the invention of writing in a way. Where, when was writing invented? And so Plato has a little story in which the king condemns the, uh, the god of writing. So it's a, an Egyptian god called Thoth, T-H-O-T, the god of writing, which was indeed, uh, Joyce mentions it in Ulysses, uh, god of writing he was at times represented as a sort of little monkey with a quill uh, at times he was with hieroglyphics and so on uh, at times with various instruments that you were used by the egyptians and so the main argument of the king king famous against writing is that if you rely on writing you will lose the exercise of memory uh, writing being a way of inscribing not only documents, but also what you have to do and so on. You will not exercise your memory and you will use, you will lose the intimate link between memory and subjectivity. Okay. And so for Plato, the, the danger was then if you let writing take over, it is, and this is the example, uh, uh, I mean, the term used by Plato is very strong. It's called pharmakos. It is, in Greek, uh, a pharmacy. Huh? It is a remedy and a poison. Writing is a poison, fundamentally. See? So um, if it is a poison, it can help a little bit, but it will poison you, you will totally rely on a writing that will slowly destroy the intimate link between your own awareness of your identity and your memory. That, that, that's uh, so any, any other question facing this? So I suggest we also like we did take a three minutes break. And then we move on to the last uh, uh, issue, which is the conversation with uh, Levinas. Sure, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. So let me just uh, repeat one thing. I've also shared the links here in the chat box for everyone. The, I've shared the, the document that uh, Professor Rabate was using for the first hour, the, the discussion about BART and uh, the notion of writing. I see there's a question which has been addressed to me about uh, writing degree zero. I mean, that's a very difficult concept to explain right here. Maybe I'll 
you know, relay that question to Professor Rabate if, if he wants to do a quick definition. It's of course part of a long tradition of looking at writing from a structuralist and then a sort of post-structuralist position, but I think I'll relay that question to Professor Rabate. Let me also share the links of the first, uh, and the, I've already shared the first two documents. I think let me also share the link for the third document, which he would be basing himself on for this final hour today. Thank you. Hi, Michelle. Hello. Michel. Hello. Yes. Sharing the documents. Okay. With them. And this Very is good. Very one good. Uh, quick question from Durgesh, who uh, would want you to explain uh, the term writing degree zero uh, briefly, if you could, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a, a great question. Uh, please ask those very fundamental questions because uh, I forget that they are not obvious. And when Barth uses the term that's a little scientific, he, he, he means it in a linguistic manner. He means that when writing is not marked by effects of literature or style, it, it may, I mean, I know that the situation with the, in the, languages you you have in in india is very different and that urdu and hindi have carried different connotations and that sanskrit as a root is very very different and so it may not a uh, be so easy to intuit as such but let me say this, um, for a long time in, in French, there was a high difference between literary language and spoken language, which I think may also be the case in the languages of cultures and so on. And that for a very long time, uh, uh, when, you were supposed to write. So this is where we, we reach that question of Camus. If you describe something in the past, you use the imperfect, le passé simple, which is more like Latin. In French, say, il va, uh, instead of il est venu. And for a, a while, even I would say, until the first half the end of the, the second world war uh, 
you could not use il est venu if you were writing a text. That was spoken language. Camus used that from the start to begin his story, which was quite a shock. See, it's a very, it's unhappily untranslatable in any other language because you have to have the same expectations. And so uh, what Bart means by this is language write, uh, writing degree zero is when language is not marked by literary style. That is, is as close as possible to the spoken vernacular of the time. In fact, one can say that the first writer may know, if you know a little bit French literature, who systematically used that language was not Camus, but Céline in Journey Until the End of the Night, also begins in It Has Begun Like This in a Spoken Manner. So this is what simply what Bart means. When he talks about uh, language uh, degree zero, he means a language that would be neuter. And then when he talks about the neuter, he uses this notion in Blanchot. Blanchot talking about the neuter, that is neither one nor the other, a sort of in between. When uh, we discuss Blanchot, I'll try to point out that Blanchot's theory is a little different from that of Barth, but fundamentally it would be a little like what Beckett was trying to say when he said that he had uh, uh, been trying to write in French in order to write without style. And so I couldn't understand the concept of Newton. Yeah. Uh, so for uh, the for uh, Blanchot, uh, the Newton is almost an ontological category. Uh, it is when things appear without being masculine or feminine, let's say. And in often, uh, Blanchot refers to his friend Levinas, who talked about there is a sort of basic uh, appearance of the world as such. Okay, I, I, but I will explain it better when we move on to Blanchot. Can we relate deconstruction to the politics of state or nation building as well? Yes, I think so. Uh, deconstruction has tried to be a political discourse. And as you can see from that example, I'd say that what's for me, distinguishes deconstruction at least as practiced by Derrida is a sort of ethical uh, openness that doesn't take any discourse for granted. And I would say that Derrida doesn't try to be either on the right or on the left, PC or anti, and that he wants to analyze the foundations of uh, nation building and so on. And for instance, for him, uh, the nationalism of the National Front, FNL, uh, which uh, fought against the French, uh, was something to question. What is that nation? What are the criteria uh, of Algerianness um, that are brought to bear? Uh, on the struggle against the French. Uh, Derrida agreed that the French had to relinquish their power and give autonomy to the Algerians. Did it have to be in the name of a concept of the Algerian nation? If there is a concept like the Algerian nation, what are the features? that will define the Algerian nation. For instance, do you have to be Muslim or not? As we know, this is still a huge tension in Algeria today. Uh, and and uh, 
the now third generation, uh, the descendants of the FNL have fought against some Muslim militants and so on. They hesitated a lot because they could not exactly define that in terms is the nationalistic feeling of belonging to a community in Algeria defined by religion or not? If not, what is it? These are, um, and so, or for instance, if you know a little bit the situation in Maghreb, what do we do with the Berber minority uh, in parts of Algeria? Uh, uh, as you may know, a, in the Roman times, uh, uh, the Berbers were a big kingdom, and then the Muslims conquered uh, that uh, part of Africa, and then the Berbers remain a, as a minority. They often have a different religion. What to do of this? So deconstruction uh, uh, tries to examine the discourse of states and politics and nation building and what would be the basis for a politics, for Derrida, uh, a politics of radical democracy would be a politics of hospitality, fundamentally. And so what, how can you create the conditions for hospitality? And uh, will you accept to keep your former masters, like the French, who were, of course, in position of domination and who had had uh, 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 terrible politics indeed, and Derrida never tries to save them, but we say, well, well, what are the conditions for a just cohabitation of different groups, minorities, and so on, without necessarily imposing the belonging to one religion, one creed, one color of skin, and so on. I hope I answered that. Uh, it's a question that I I've often been asked um, talking uh, about Derrida in, in Israel uh, um, and uh, uh, I, I could not disguise the fact that Derrida, uh, although being Jewish, was, uh, all his friends were Palestinians. So see, and this posed some problems. In, in Israel. And, uh, but for all these questions, Derrida wants you, and I think any, any of us, to try and examine all those situations as simply and radically as possible to see what are the criteria of belonging with the idea that his uh, main hope is for this idea of democracy. And so democracy here, one can say that Derrida would not agree with someone like Alain Badiou, who think that communism is the key word. For Derrida, it is still democracy. However, it is not any democracy as we know them, but a democracy that has to be shaped in the future, a democracy to come. And a democracy that would be hospitable to the foreigners, to, to, to the others somehow. Okay, if there are no um, more questions, I'll turn to, uh, so am I sharing my screen here? Do you have totality and infinity? It's yet to come. Yeah, good, good, yeah. Okay, so I want to begin with this, uh, so this is the introduction to totality and infinity, a great book uh, by, uh, you, you can, no, I, I am not, oh, am okay. I, uh, you, 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 you can see, you, you can see, you can see the page. Yes. No, let me just see. Uh, no, indeed. Okay. Uh, am I am I share, sharing it now? Yes. Mm. No, not up to this no. point. Uh, you 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 cannot see the page of totality and infinity. Uh, 
No. Uh, stop the re Now? Now we can. Yeah, yes. now we can. Very good, very good. Thank you. Okay. Good. Sorry. It's a little complicated by the fact that I have a French system that uh, at times. So this is uh, a text uh, that for Derrida was a very important philosophical text. Huh? Um, and um, it begins like this. Uh, Everyone would readily agree that it is of the highest importance to know whether we are not duped by morality. Does not lucidity, the mind's openness upon the true, consist in catching sight of the permanent possibility of war? The state of war suspends morality. It diverts the eternal institution obligation of eternity and resigns at interim the unconditional imperatives. War is not only one of the ordeals, the greatest of which morality lives, it renders morality derisory. And uh, one can say that um, uh, Levinas' thinking is, uh, as he puts it here, eschatology institutes a relation with being beyond the totality, beyond history, a surplus always exterior to the totality. And these are the terms with which Derina, De, uh, uh, Levinas begins. Uh, and it will be a little too long to summarize uh, this fantastic book. But one can say that Levinas introduces in philosophy a different discourse that he calls the discourse of Jewish philosophy, a discourse of ethics, and ethics predicated on the central concept, which is the other, the other being, the other human subject. And uh, what Levinas is saying is that when I see the face of the other, I am reminded of the divine commandment, thou shalt not kill. And there is, in respect for the life of the other, a respect for the infinity of the other being. And this infinity introduces us to the domain of ethics. Ethics, as Levinas defines it, is opposed to classical philosophy. And for him, anything that goes from Plato to Heidegger is classical philosophy based on Greek notions of philosophy. Indeed, in English, we have kept this uh, when we say philosophy, and I live in Philadelphia, and everybody knows in Philadelphia that we have a Greek name, uh, phile means to like, and Adelphia, the brothers. Uh, uh, we are, I live in the city of brotherly love, so-called. Um, and philosophy, we love, phila, sophia, sophia uh, not, uh, wisdom, uh, the love of wisdom. As soon as we use those words, uh, we are inscribed in the Greek tradition, the Greek language, the language of philosophy. According to Levinas, if we move away from what he calls ontology, the discourse of ontology, the discourse of metaphysics, towards this new Jewish ethics of the other, uh, one leaves behind uh, a discourse that he sees compromised from mostly by Heidegger, uh, can go back to the politics of Heidegger. And uh, but in, indeed, in Heidegger, you don't have an ethics. And fundamentally, what Levinas is hoping for is to create the conditions, the possibility for peace. Because peace, for him, is what should be the aim 
of philosophy as ethics, a respect of the other and a rejection of the totalitarian urge to destroy all the others, meaning uh, the Nazi moment um, in uh, uh, 20th century history. And uh, this is where we find um, in uh, the, uh, Levinas, the weird, so having said this, uh, in order to understand what uh, Derrida does with Levinas. So let me see again. I want to show you this to you. This is what um, uh, how Levinas talks about Derrida. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who compared the effect of deconstruction to the sudden void in political power that the French experienced during the exodus following the German army victory in 1940. And so this is uh, after Levinas had read the essay I'm going to discuss with you, uh, Violence and Metaphysics, in which Derrida questioned Levinas is thinking from so many angles at once. At the beginning, everything is in place. After a few pages of paragraphs, under the impact of a terrifying questioning, nothing remains as a habitable site for thought. Here was, beside the philosophical meaning of the propositions, a purely literary effect, the new frisson, the poetry of Jacques Derrida. When reading him, I see again the exodus of 1940, the retreating military unit, which is a city that has no inkling of what is happening, where cafes are still open, where society ladies still go to novelty fashion stores, where hairdressers cut hair, bakers bake, Viscounts meet other Viscounts and exchange stories about Viscount, and one hour later, everything is empty, desolate, houses closed or abandoned, left with open doors, suddenly devoid of all inhabitants. Uh, so this is quite a strong uh, analogy. Huh? Uh, <laughs> Derrida's philosophy would create exactly that. Suddenly, everything has changed. Why? Because Derrida suspends the foundation of all foundations, our innate and obdurate belief in self-presence. I note here that symptomatically, Levinas talks about a purely literary effect. And he mentioned the poetry of Derrida's thought, which betrays some impatience, if not a lingering resentment. Levinas insinuates that he will not mix philosophy with literature, and indeed seems to suggest that Derrida may have won too fast. And uh, this is a point that uh, has been shared by a number of uh, Anglo-American philosophers of language, uh, that uh, Derrida apparently won a certain war too fast. And I, in that, I compared it with the uh, first campaign in Iraq and the way in which, surprisingly, the signifier of deconstruction had been used by Steve Bannon, uh, the mastermind behind Trump's uh, populist ideology, who wanted the deconstruction of the uh, uh, administrative state. Uh, um, I would simply say here that we have to see what is happening so that um, someone like Levinas can speak of this uh, terrifying suspension of everything and um, uh, why um, the uh, writing, the essay in writing and difference uh, would be so um, uh, uh, terrifying for Levinas and 
here I uh, wanted to uh, mention, okay, the, the, the an infinity, the um, Tenida de Venus, yes, um, in which what Derrida does, if you have read the whole essay of, uh, sorry, totality infinity, yeah, that's what I, what I have here. Uh, we can see that Derrida is looking, and I, I will focus only on one passage of this long, early essay by uh, Derrida. Uh, he shows, and so it's a little what I was trying to suggest uh, before, uh, uh, one basic uh, reproach to uh, uh, Levinas, and let's see whether I can share this now. Yes, I, I am sharing. Yes, it's coming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, what he is uh, uh, saying, this demonstration will refer once more to the Cartesian Corito, third meditation be beyond Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, Husserl, and does so according to a schema that seems to us to support the entirety of Levinas' thought. Uh, the other is the other only if his alterity is absolutely irreducible, infinitely irreducible. The infinite other can only be infinity. And uh, basically what he is trying to show is that at one point, um, if Levinas wants to go outside the language of metaphysics, he is condemned, and this is what uh, Derrida is saying in uh, a complex manner, to a purely religious position, because as long as he uses the language of philosophy, he remains as long as he speaks with Heidegger, with Husserl, with Descartes, he remains within the same uh, circle of concepts. The other way language can go beyond is the face-to-face -face with God. Uh, God would arrive too early. Uh, and indeed, God's name is mentioned a few times in uh, uh, totality and infinity and in a sense we then move to religion the ethics of ethics uh, as he asked is it beyond all laws is it the law, the law of all laws and so on and then uh, in a second movement Derrida tries to go beyond this question of is it just religion here this would be the same position as Alain Badiou. Uh, for Alain Badiou, the problem of Levinas is that Levinas thinks he is doing philosophy, but in fact, he is in a religious discourse. Fine if you're religious, fine if you believe in the monotheistic God of the Jewish Bible, but not so if you're not. And then for Badiou, the rest, can be left as totally superfluous. Derrida goes a little further and tries to see what is happening in what he called the inscription of the written origin in this thinking. And uh, as he says, let us repeat all this within philosophical discourse, <clears throat> where the thought of death itself, without metaphor, and the thought of a positive infinity have never been able to understand each other. Fundamentally, here you can say that through this concept of death, and here we have a slightly different notion, it's not so much death as writing as death in the Heideggerian sense. And for Heidegger, 
there is a sort of absolute finitude the, as Heidegger defines it, uh, we are for death. Death is the end. There is no beyond death, uh, life and death and so on. We have also, Derrida says, <clears throat> to think through history. And history is, as he reminds us, the discourse of violence. And remember, this is the starting point of Levinas. When we talk about history, history is the history of all the wars and the fact that when there is a war, morality is most of the time totally suspended, has no relevance, and so on. And this is where Derrida insists upon this idea of transcendental violence uh, and that there is in, even in, the philosophy of Levinas, a philosophy of violence, uh, and that uh, what he tries to do, and here I'm going too fast, but as he notes, Derrida uh, uh, shares with Levinas a double reference, a reference to Husserl and a reference to Heidegger. In the 30s, Levinas was the first French philosopher who had understood Husserl and wrote the first book on the theory of intuition in Husserl. And at the same time, he had gone um, to Freiburg and he had heard some classes by Heidegger and he saw what Heidegger was doing in phenomenology. Uh, and like Heidegger, but differently, uh, Levinas subverts or exceeds the Husserlian uh, idea of phenomenology. Uh, uh, what uh, the, One of the points uh, Derrida makes, and then we'll see this because this is the passage I want to focus on. As you can see, it's a very, very long uh, essay on in writing and difference. And I have to say that for me, this essay on Levinas is perhaps the most original and I would say foundational philosophical text of Derrida. Uh, uh, at some point, Derrida objects that there is in Levinas's philosophy a philosophy of economy, a philosophy of the return. And there is an ego, and the other for me is an ego, which I know to be in relation to me as an other. Where have these movements been better described than in the phenomenology of the mind, of virtual spirit? And so uh, what Derrida is trying to show, and this is a trick that he plays on other philosophers in uh, the same collection, uh, writing and difference mostly with Georges Bataille. And happily, we won't have time to discuss Bataille. But basically, to Bataille and to Levinas, he reproaches the same thing. How can you bypass Hegel? And in Levinas's philosophy, the reference to Hegel is avoided. Why? Because for him, uh, Hegel is uh, the thinker of the same, of the return to the same. Uh, uh, Levinas, according to uh, his uh, thinking, uh, remains economical. There is a transcendental and pre-ethical violence, a general dissymmetry whose archaea is the same and which eventually permits the inverse dissymmetry that is the ethical nonviolence of which Levinas speaks. Basically, what Derrida is trying to show is that every time Levinas speaks of ethical nonviolence, he is in fact enacting a stronger violence in order to try and go beyond the categories of philosophy in which he is completely closed in, enclosed, and cannot cannot leave, uh, which then, see, links to the concept 
that Derrida introduces, the difference between the same of other difference with an A, that is an active difference. And uh, this would be, uh, this difference would be uh, an eschatology that could only happen through violence. And uh, this violence will return to war, uh, fundamentally. So I'm going a little faster here to a long text, as you can see, is so of ontological violence. See? And then he quotes Bataille. Uh, 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 so silence is a word which is not a word, breath an object which is not an object. Uh, and with this, he goes to this idea that in order to go beyond being, you are obliged to return to a certain state of war. And the state of war is a kind of active difference. I'm going, as you can see, uh, a, a long analysis of uh, <clears throat> uh, the roots of language, being, consciousness, nature, uh, and alterity, uh, being, all the themes that Derrida will return to um, uh, later, and shows that Levinas simultaneously proposes to us a humanism and a metaphysics. And he thinks that this is not possible to do, because if there is a metaphysics, it has to be predicated on a totally different God, a God who is at the limit, who is beyond, and that excludes any humanism of the other. And <clears throat> I want again to go on to this question of eschatology. As you can see in that text, facing Levinas, Derrida, I would say is the most ferocious and I would say like knowing at Levinas, taking his texts and quoting them and inverting them. He ends this text with this, and I will use it later on to talk about Joyce. See? Are we Jews? Are we Greeks? We live in the difference between the Jew and the Greek, which is perhaps the unity of what is called history. We live in and of different, that is in hypocrisy, about which Levinas so profoundly says that it is not only, quote, it not only a base contingent defect of man, but the underlying, underlying rending of a world attached to both the philosophers and the prophets at the beginning of totality and infinity. Are we Greeks? Are we Jews? But who we? Are we not a chronological, but a pre-logical question First Jews or first Greeks. And there's a strange dialogue between the Jew and the Greek. Peace itself has the form of the absolute speculative logic of Hegel, the living logic which reconciles formal tautology and empirical heterology after having thought prophetic discourse in the preface to the phenomenology of the mind. Or, on the contrary, that this peace have the form of infinite separation and of the unthinkable, unsayable transcendence of the other. To what horizon of peace does the language which has this question belong? From whence does it draw the energy of its question? Can it account for the historical coupling of Judaism and Hellenism? And what is the legitimacy, what is the meaning of the copula in this proposition from perhaps the most Hegelian of modern novelists Jew Greek is Greek Jew, extremes meet. And there you have a reference to Joyce Ulysses. Uh, this comes from the Circe episode in Ulysses. Um, the question here, as you can see, is can we, as Levinas hopes, reject Greek thinking and say we have to think in a Jewish manner? Uh, and uh, were we first Jews or first Greeks? Uh, with Heidegger, uh, 
this would be the reverse for Heidegger. To think well is to go back to the Greek texts of the pre-Socratics uh, at a time before Plato took over and tried to, in a way, corner metaphysics in his own way. Uh, for the later Heidegger, as you may know, if you read him, uh, one has to reread endlessly a few fragments of Heraclitus, Parmenides, and uh, um, Anaximander, and all those pre-Socratic thinkers who think in a Greek that is layered, opaque, that has to be retranslated endlessly into German, the German of Heidegger. <clears throat> Here, uh, Derrida says, we live in the difference between the Jew and the Greek, which is perhaps the unity of what is called history. We live in and of difference. See, that is his main statement in philosophy. We cannot just get rid of the Greek world. We cannot get rid of philosophy. As long as we use those Greek terms, we are Greek. But we can try to think as Jews or like Jews uh, <clears throat> to escape from the possibility of a totality. <clears throat> and here, uh, you see, there is this dialogue for the Rida, a dialogue between the Jew and the Greek. What would be wrong for him, according to him, is Levinas's idea that <clears throat> instead of a dialogue, you have a complete departure and suddenly you are elsewhere. At the beginning of totality and infinity, Levinas opposes two models for thought. One, he says, is the classical Greek paradigm. The Greek paradigm is the return home, which is that of Odysseus, the Odyssey. And that's why at the end, Joyce is mentioned here. For Levinas, this is the mode of Greek thinking. You have home, a wandering, a war, the destruction of the enemy, <clears throat> that is uh, uh, the story of the Iliad, uh, how the Greeks uh, defeat the Trojans. There is a war, a very long war, they win. But then the Odyssey is the story of the hero, Odysseus, who has to return home after many adventures, and he has even to go to hell, and then he can meet Penelope and be reunited with his legitimate wife. This, according to Levinas, is Greek thinking, uh, a thinking in which the encounter with the other is just a sort of ordeal that then uh, justifies the need for a return home. The other paradigm, according to Levinas, is that of the biblical prophets, the prophets who are announcing the coming of the Messiah, but the Messiah hasn't come, still waiting for the Messiah to come. And uh, these prophets live in the desert and they are not uh, like either the Egyptians and the, the other rulers. Uh, they want to have a sort of one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with infinity, the infinity of a God that is completely transcendent uh, and absolute transcendence. And in that respect for transcendence, they think a different ethics and ethics of the other. Uh, <clears throat> here, interestingly, uh, Derrida uh, puts uh, the phenomenology of Levinas's other in line with that of Hegel. Uh, prophetic discourse is already thought in the preface to the phenomenology of mind. <clears throat> By having Levinas inscribed within the phenomenology of mind, Derrida slyly uh, 
cunningly implies that peace is not the key, but rather war. Because if you've read Hegel's Phenomenology of Mind, you will know that what Hegel is describing is a systematic state in which um, every moment has been, I'll stop the, the, share, the, the text, uh, every moment uh, of uh, the progression of spirit through history is defined by a state of war. Uh, for um, Hegel, what is well known is one of those moments, but it is not the last one and not the first one, is the famous story of the master and the slave, uh, the struggle between the two uh, enemies, one is vanquished and accepts to be a slave, and the master uh, will enjoy the benefits of being on top of things, but then in Hegel's analysis, then the master will be defeated by the slave who can work and so on. We know that Marx found the logic, a certain logic of history in it, but as we know, Hegel doesn't stop history there. There's also the analysis of the French Revolution in order for me to return to my initial reference to Barthes and the French Revolution. Uh, we know that partly Hegel meditates on the violence contained in the French Revolution and a moment when everybody can be beheaded as a suspect when uh, totalitarian power is so absolute that death is inevitable and so on. <clears throat> so, uh, here we have Derrida reintroducing the condition of universal war uh, against Derrida, uh, against Levinas's, I would say, humanistic theology of peace. Uh, and he's trying to say to uh, Levinas, well, in fact, no, your ideal of peace is impossible. It was quite normal in order to return to this that when Devinas went back to the effect of Derrida on philosophy and on him, he would talk about that moment, uh, as he says, that Levinas had known. Uh, I want to insist on this because uh, in that struggle between uh, Levinas and Derrida, we have something that is quite central for French philosophy. Let me remind you, in case you don't know that, so Le Levinas, uh, first language was not French. First language was Russian, Lithuanian, and Yiddish. And then he came to Strasbourg and he worked in French philosophy and uh, then went to study in Germany and again was one of those first initiators to the thinking of Husserl and Heidegger. So, new German very well. Nevertheless, like uh, Derrida, uh, Levinas wrote in French. We now have his very interesting notebooks written mostly during his captivity. I'll return to this later, and you'll have that. I, I think it's part of the text that I'll, I'll discuss in a later moment, but I'll mention it briefly in passing, a text that Derrida attacks ferociously uh, is a text in which Levinas talks about his situation during the war. Uh, you've noted that he compares Derrida with the moment when the war arrives and then everything is suspended. Uh, there was before a sort of everyday life, and then suddenly everybody has to run, the laws are suspended, and so on. But then what happened to Levinas, in uh, fact, was Levinas had been conscripted in the French army, and he was made a prisoner. And being, he was Jewish, but being a war prisoner with the French army, he was not executed, and he was in fact spared. He, he spent the war in a camp, 
with prisoners in a unit in which there were all Jewish prisoners, none of whom was killed as all the Jews who were sent to the death camps and, and uh, Auschwitz and the rest. So for Levinas, that was a very interesting situation. Uh, he had become French. French was not his native language. Um, uh, I, I heard him speak until the last Levinas had a slight trace of Russian accent, you might say, in French. Um, but Derrida had absolutely no accent in his French, native French. That's a slight difference here. Uh, and we know from Levinas's notebooks during the war that Levinas wanted to write a long Proustian novel, but he only wrote a few pages and then couldn't do it. And then went on meditating and preparing for his masterpiece, Totality and Infinity. It's very interesting to see in his notebooks that at times he, write in, he writes in Russian. Um, so Russian was one of the native languages that, that he had. <clears throat> and so Levinas had had the experience of being a war prisoner and of that legal fiction that nevertheless saved his life, that as a member of French army, he could not be considered as a non-human being who could be executed. And this is the story. I hope you uh, can read it and I'll return to it later of how this group of prisoners um, uh, being totally rejected by the local German population nevertheless managed to have a little dog and they had a dog that uh, followed them and they decided to call that dog Bobby and in a famous text uh, uh, Levinas concludes in Germany there was only one Kantian philosopher it was that little dog Bobby because Bobby recognized us as human beings okay interestingly when Derrida read this text, he is extremely critical. I return to that. And uh, there we see the severity, maybe, or cruelty of Derrida's philosophy. Uh, that deconstruction uh, has also to examine moments of pathos that we could say, oh, this is really a nice, pathetic moment when finally all the Jewish prisoners are recognized by the German dog. Derrida has no patience with that. Uh, this seems to be too much in between, and he will try to go deeper and question it. And we, we'll see that uh, next time. But I'll stop here because I've been speaking too long. And if you have questions, do we have uh, time for a few questions, Orca? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if I may quickly uh, perhaps start uh, the, the questions, I was just thinking about two things there. I mean, one, if you could uh, link the three uh, discussions, you know, especially I was kind of thinking about the, the relation between the idea of writing in the mm -hmm. first hour's discussion and uh, the historical contextualization around Algeria and the, the positioning vis-a-vis -vis, uh, nationalism, uh, the political question of the war, whether or not this historical context has something to do with the idea of writing that you were developing in the first hour. I was kind of wondering about that link there. And just a second point, which is again, perhaps a, a more of a, like a, a question, but also maybe if you could clarify something here. So I was kind of wondering about uh, Derrida's late turn towards ethics and whether yes. something mm -hmm. in his relation with Levinas changed there or did it remain right. exactly the same you you're absolutely right uh, I, I see a very good question um uh, from protichi chatterjee uh, uh you can all read this the question or is it just for me no i think some of them are sending questions so, to me so, so i uh i i hope uh protichi will allow me to read the question yes yeah, I think that's fine that's fine in okay, fact, good. Request okay, there, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so right that, that, that's a perfect question. Thank you. 
I, I quote, I had this impression after reading Derrida's forgiveness that he was more oriented to the Levinasian model of love for the other. I think he also mentioned this in his strange institution that is literature as literature being something that can reach out to the other. Yes, you're absolutely right. What I, uh, and, and uh, Arka's question is also perfect. In the early 60s, when Derrida looks at Levinas, he introduces the question of writing in Levinas's philosophy. That is quite obvious. And this is what he does in many, many ways, <clears throat> with many approaches in what I've quoted too fast. And it's a very long text. So I'm sorry, we would need like a whole day to read it quite systematically. And it's a relentless text that basically throws at totality and infinity all of philosophy, <laughs> from the Greeks to Plato, from to Heidegger, to Hegel, to Descartes, to Kierkegaard, and so on. That, hey, what do you do with this? Isn't that part of your system? It should be there. But fundamentally, intrinsically, the root of the argument is to say, you forget what I was quoting at the end, difference. And difference with an A for the younger Derrida means writing, not exactly as writing and as literature, but the process of difference. That is something is never what it seems to be, <clears throat> is always divided in itself and so on. And so you cannot have a, such a strict division, let's say between Greek and Jew and so on. Uh, writing is Greek and Jew together. <clears throat> However, 30 years later, uh, having discussed writing at some length, Derrida becomes much closer to Levinas indeed. You're totally right. Huh? And the sort of becoming Levinas, <laughs> uh, 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 Deleuze uh, uh, would say, in the later Derrida. However, in certain passages, like the uh, posthumous text on the animal that therefore I am, uh, there is a ferocious attack on, on Levinas. So it's quite complex. Huh? I have indeed, I agree with you, uh, the impression, yes, that's it. And, and the idea of hospitality contradicts the state of universal war. Yeah. Uh, but Derrida would say uh, the idea of hospitality is not a simple idea. It should assume that war is always a possibility. The realistic view that there is war somehow. It, absolutely. Derrida's thinking is, is, a con is a consciously contradictory way of thinking. That is, uh, is always telling to people who think they can think without contradiction, aha, there is a contradiction. And then when he comes to his own position, says, yes, I have my contradiction and I know about it. I, I, I could return to that. But yes, what I noted, at least in the <clears throat> last decade of Derrida's uh, thinking, uh, it sounds very much like the, like Divinas. <clears throat> and so, uh, he, he, and all his many of the later tout autre et tout autre huh, uh, in, in repeated is very hard to translate into English. Every other is all other, or all other is every other, mm, can mean both in French, very Levinasian. Huh? Uh, but it would be the Levinas, I would say, if you know a little bit the thinking of Levinas that Levinas himself, because he was hit by Derrida's critique. And we know that he, he, he said this, um, I, I heard this from my friend Alain David, who was uh, a disciple of Levinas, that Levinas for a while uh, in the 60s stopped writing because he felt Derrida really caused him a huge problem. But then he wrote otherwise than being and tried to find a new syntax to bypass Derrida's arguments, uh, I would say. But, and at the same time, 
in his own evolution, Derrida was more and more obsessed with issues of justice, of democracy, hospitality, openness to the other, that are absolutely Levinasian themes. Yeah. And so, God, would you consider the telephone question? Yeah. Uh, yes, the question. So I, I quote, would you consider under the, quote, under the impact of a terrifying questioning, nothing remains as a habitable site for thought. That is, the questioning of several fundamental fundamentals leaves not much room for thinking a general criticism levied at post-structuralism. <clears throat> I think that when Levinas says, under the impact of a terrifying questioning, he really is reminiscing about how Derrida basically shoots at him like a machine gun. <laughs> we say it's rather terrifying what Derrida does to him. Uh, and then uh, what he, he says, you cannot return to some kind of agreed upon basis for thinking. That's what Le Levinas was looking for. <clears throat> See, in for him, there was Husserl, and Husserl's point of departure was the question of consciousness. What kind of cogito is implied that Husserl discarded partly the Cartesian model, but was thinking a, a cogito that bracketed off the world, but was also enmeshed in other cogitos and so on. It remained a philosophy of consciousness. The starting point for Heidegger was a question of being as contained in being there, being in existence. And that was ontological difference. That was a starting point. And then the question of being for the later Heidegger was the question of language, language as being, language as keeping the site for being and so on. For Levinas, it was this idea of the Jewish radicality of infinity as opposed to totality. These were possible starting points. <clears throat> In structuralism, as Derrida had shown, there was a certain scientism and that believed in science as a sort of absolute and brought us back to ontological naivety and so on. And so indeed, uh, uh, I, 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 the recording has stopped. No, I think, yeah, yeah. I lost the connection for a while. I'm back now. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I see, I see. And so, yes, in, in, indeed, uh, uh, the questioning of third fundamental leaves no much room for thinking of general criticism uh, that post structuralism, absolutely. That um, the point is not to criticize post structuralism, but to re examine any foundation. That's the key for Derrida. Uh, so, any foundation will be examined as drastically and radically as possible. This is where uh, uh, the construction brings brings you. Yes. Any other other question? Okay. Uh, if I could quickly uh, make maybe so, for, so, for yeah, just uh, for the sake of ease, uh, perhaps yeah. all the students could uh, type out the questions to everyone so that everyone. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I think it's yes. easier for everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, Thank you so much, Professor uh, Adli. Uh, Does the Levinasian concept of totality include the anti Hegelian system of becoming through which the spirit becomes in a state of continued dialectical conflict? If yes, it is the monotheistic God who lies beyond this totality, thought of as infinity by Levinas. Yes, you got it well. Uh, for Levinas, the Hegelian system is a system in which there is always consciousness discovering an other, 
and then making this other part of the same in a mechanism that Hegel calls Aufhebung, uh, sublation. This is the reader's translation. Uh, and so each time there is an other, the other forces the same to be a little different, but absorb the other and progresses and so on. And in the end, is supposed to reach a sort of absolute knowledge. And so uh, for uh, Levinas, who's thinking is hard to dissociate from monotheistic Jewish religion, uh, it is the monotheistic God that lies beyond the totality. However, the interesting uh, analysis of, of Levinas is to say, well, this infinite otherness that traditionally had been attributed to God in Jewish monotheism is also something I can discover through my consciousness, so in a Hegelian way, when I look at another human being, I discover radical infinity that is quasi-religious. So this was the main invention of Levinas. <clears throat> Derrida rejects that kind of well-meaning mixture of humanism and total transcendence and infinity. So is Derrida's refutation of Venus somewhat apophatic of asking for new infinity? Ah, doesn't, according to Derrida himself, thinking about this new it, it, infinity return one to the same totality. How to go beyond this paradox of absolute difference between creation as becoming and an inherently Gnostic God of monotheism in apophatic theology? Yes. You, this is a good question because uh, you probably have read Derrida has written a lot about religion. There's a great uh, collection called Acts of Religion. And for Derrida, who always refused to say whether he believed in God or not, um, <clears throat> I was present at a conference at Villanova University where Caputo, who is a Christian, uh, tried to make Derrida confess whether he was uh, agnostic or religious, and Derrida managed to evade for more than an hour <laughs> the uh, question. Uh, Derrida uh, uh, is closer to an apophatic theology, absolutely. That is a, a theology of the impossibility of saying the name of God. And I I see this much closer to a certain, uh, he shares, I would say, the position defended, if you know this, by Walter Benjamin in the thesis on the philosophy of history, when Benjamin uh, yes. uh, thinks a sort of messianism, uh, a weak messianism, or uh, for Derrida, a messianism without a messiah. And that, yes, that, that's, that's a sort of Jewish mysticism of the impossibility of saying the name of God, but keeping the name of God as a possible vision of infinity. Yes, I, 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 I agree with that. Well, I think, uh, uh, thank you for all the great uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> and um, if... Um, uh, no more coming. We we can stop here and uh, yeah, this is a good time meet to again uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> and so we'll uh, thank you very. Uh,